to come true. Hey, fantasy. Hammer, don't you know I love you? For giving me a chance to be in your show. And you know that I would do the best that I can. But I got a call from Louis Burrell, Hammer's big brother. And he was like, look, man, he was matter of fact. He was like, we've been out on this road. We've been going through some ish, and we're on our way home. He was like, we don't want to come home to some ish short. So he was basically saying, whatever the fuck you own, we're tired, bro. Like, don't, we're not, we're not, it's just, it's not happening. If you just take the weight of my pants and the dancing and just focus on the people that wasn't on stage, like, like when the crew walk up, don't look at the dancers, look at the other dudes. You would have figured that it's out. He's a gangster, you don't want to get killed. Do you go easy? Even, you know, you hear all the stuff talking about, oh, he was taking the money. So we thought, oh, we go to Church Boy. We'll go with MC Hammer, but he was the most gangster one of all of them. I heard about it. You know what? That guy not MC Hammer, fuck him, fuck his mama, and the whole nine. That nigga came up to me with the last episode they shot when they had everybody rapping on it. MC Hammer was there. That nigga approached me. He was like, Red, I'm gonna tell you something, you young, but I don't allow nobody talking about my mama. You understand me? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, my name is Benito Glossy. I'm a former member of the MC Hammer Crew. And what are we gonna talk about today? The artist, Benito, behind MC Hammer. First story we talk about today is Too Short, hometown friend of MC Hammers. I remember it very, very clearly. We were at Summer Jam back in the early 90s in um, Mountain View, California. And Hammer had already had, got word of uh, Too Short going around doing the, uh, he had a record out that was talking about Hammer. So 50 million dancers in a big old band. And, um, Hammer wanted to talk to shoot too short about that because like, man, we're both from the same town. Why are you pushing that type of agenda when all I try to do is help people out and help the city? We're both from the city, so we're doing positive things. But the situation went from that to this. Um, Hammer's in the dressing room, we was in the dressing room together. And uh, one of the guys came in and told Hammer, man, too short is here. And Hammer said, okay, where you at? He's eating next door, matter of fact. So we got up, everybody went outside, went to knock on too short's door to the dressing room. He came out with his crew, whatever. And Hammer basically uh, semi-checked him on the situation. He was like, man, why are you doing this and doing that and whatever? He's like, man, no, nah, man, it's just all fun, man. You know, I ain't, I, I'm not, you know, I want to do it in a, in a malicious way to you, Hammer, whatever. He said, but man, the whole world is looking at that and it looks like a negative thing going on with me and you because we both from the same town, Oakland, and people ain't, you know, they, they don't know no difference in that. They think it's really real and true. So that being said, uh, Two Show had a guy with him by the name of Chris, and Chris was the producer or the manager for the group, The Loonies, at the time. And um, he had a lot to say, and uh, Hammer's best friend, uh, Juice, um, says real name, Brittany Sneed, he stepped up. This is a guy with a ponytail, back to say, look like an Indian. He stepped to Chris, and, and they both had words and told him, you know, to calm down, you know, the situation, because it really was getting out of hand. And, uh, in the story, they basically diffused the whole thing and had a good talk about what was going on and diffused the situation. 
But Keith Shore definitely got uh, approached on that deal. Um, that's one of them things that happened behind MC Hammer. My name is Benito. I'm the artist Benito. Um, Hammer signed me at Grambling State University and uh, and Grambling, Louisiana. And it was a concert, it was a spring concert. Uh, and it had MC Hammer, Heavy D, 357, Ace Shoes, and God. And Hammer was having uh, an audition. I didn't know till later, my best friend at the time, uh, he was Hammer's first cousin. And he had been in contact with Hammer back and forth. And you know, as anybody's a friend, you coming from a small town, Elwood, Arkansas, you know, you tell you MC Hammer, my cousin, at the time Hammer started the bubble. That's when he had out, you know, they put me in the mix and, you know, pump it up and all that. When he first started with all the troop stuff on and everything. And we was all into that, we was dancing and all that. And he's like, yo, he said, man, Hammer, my cousin, he gonna be in Grambling. So we come down for the concert, we gonna meet him. I was like, okay, well, um, you know, I'm still skeptical. And boy, when they came through that courtyard uh, in the buses, you know, I was like, wow, them two of us, I was fascinated. Remind yourself now, I'm uh, I'm 18 years old and I'm a kid, so I, I'm mind blown. I'm like, wow. So one of the buses stopped way in the front, about five buses. And uh, got the bus, it was Hammer's brother, Chris Burrell. And Jimmy walked up, my friend, and said, uh, hey man, how you doing? He said, he said, who are you? He said, I'm Chris Burrell. He said, I'm Jimmy. He said, hey, what's up, cuz? You know, they instantly connected and talked and everything. And um, he said, yo, this is my friend Benito. He said, he's seen, he said, I rap, but he's seen. He said, man, what happened, man? He said, you on the bus, you wanna meet him? He said, yeah, he's like, yeah. He's like, yeah. So we both get on the bus right then. Everybody coming around, surrounding the buses or whatever, we get up on the bus. Go back there, and I see Hammer sitting back in the corner, chilling, eating some popcorn. I'm like, whoa. And I'm standing there, I ain't saying nothing. You know, hey, what's going on with you? He said, yeah, and Jimmy's like all into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm your cousin, whatever. They, 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 what's up, cousin? Ooh. He said, Chris told me about you, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, you know, I got a lot of other cousins down there too. A lot of other people, Hammer, well, people don't know, Hammer's people are from Bastrop, Louisiana. And uh, Hammer was born in Oakland, but a lot of people think he was born in Vegas, but he wasn't. He was born in Oakland, but uh, he was the last in one born, that's the boys. Anyway, uh, we talked to him, he said, man, he said, man, my friend sing him. He said, oh yeah, you can sing? You can sing something then. I mean, he put me on the spot right off the top. I was like, uh-huh. He said, what's wrong, you scared or something? I said, no. He said, well, sing then. So I sung a little bit of him, like, okay, 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 cool, 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 cool. All right, I like that, I like that. He said, yo, we're gonna have auditions tonight, man, back in Monroe, Louisiana at the Holodome. So uh come over there, man, for the uh auditions, man. I'd like to see you, see what hear more from you. I'm like, okay, so right now we're gonna go. Y'all go to the game? He's like, yeah, no, yeah, we're going to the game. So we're still on the bus with us, we're gonna go over there. We're gonna go down to the thing you can come in with us. I'm like, okay, cool. So we're riding the bus over to the game, did the game and everything, man. Left hand out with him, we backstage, all we just on cloud 59. So later that evening. I called my mama to let her know that uh, I'm gonna be a little late today. You better be on time and bring my car, boy. And I knew I was in my mama's car. You know, you know how they do kid. So my, my partner, like, man, we gotta go to Monroe. Don't tell your mama, we gotta go to Monroe, man. And I think that was one of the best moves I ever made because if I hadn't made that move, I'd have never been with MCM, you know, never experienced what I experienced. And I took the gamble. Even though I was gonna knew I was gonna get punished, get, get grounded, it was okay. So my thing was okay with, 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 with the grounders. I, um, what I did was I went on over, went in, and we got a chance to um, audition for Hammer. And I was the last person. I was all scared of all I do. I didn't know what to do. I saw all the other people say, way better than me and everything. He gonna pick them, man. I said, I, said, I know he gonna pick them over me. But I was in the race. I did what I did. And Hammer said, oh, wait a minute, wait, wait. I got somebody with me. So Hammer calls Teddy Riley. And Teddy comes down. And Teddy comes downstairs and I saw him. And Teddy was like, yo, Hammer, if you don't sign this kid, I am. 
And Hammer said, no, 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 don't worry about it. I got him, I got him, I got him. Welcome to Buster Records with each other. And I was like, what? I said, what's that? And he said, it's my record label. Do you never make records before? I said, no, sir. He said, man, you got company. Let's just say, no, you no, know, Hammer, Hammer. Just call me Hammer, man. I was like, well, no, no, Hammer. He said, uh, well, you on my label now. I'm signing to my label, man. I said, you got to call my mama. <laughs> He's like, huh? I said, you got to call my mama. Let my mama know. I got to tell my mama. <laughs> He's like, okay, call her. So we got on the phone and called my mom. My mom, first thing she said, now, it's about one o'clock in the morning. Mom was like, where my car at? He told you to get it right. Boy, I'm going to keep, you know. Like, mama, I'm coming, my mama. But here, hold up, mama got some good news. Mama, hold up, hold up. If see Hammer want to sign me to his record label. If see who? Hammer? Whatever. You better bring my car, boy. So with that being said, Hammer got on the phone and talked to my mom. He told her what was going on. And uh, she's like, yeah, whatever. Get away from here before you get in trouble or something. Yeah, you get on back into school or something. Do something. Stay in school. Because I, I, I want to make somebody self. I said, mama. He said, can you be back in the morning here at 6 o'clock in the morning and roll with me? Go to the next city? I said, huh? He said, yeah, it happens that fast. Then go home, get your stuff, pack your bag, and come on. So I'm gonna shoot be taken care of. So Hammers, first time he hits the manager, Craig Brooks said, no, no, no. We ain't got no room on the bus. Hammers said, I'll make room for it. Don't worry about it, I got it. So with that being said, he told Hammer, convinced him not to take me on the road with him right then. So Hammer gave me all his numbers and everything. He said, yo, man, get my numbers and everything. Keep my information. I'll be calling you. I love what you're doing. I want you on my label. And I'm gonna send for you to come to California and be with me. So, of course, I was disappointed and then my heart dropped. But I, I called him one time, he didn't answer the phone. I was like, man, he, you know, forgot all about it. So, about maybe a month and a half later, I called the number and Hammer answered. He talked to me, man, don't worry about it. And I got you, I got you. Do what you're gonna do. Just be careful. Hold on, I'm gonna get you back out of California, whatever. So me and my friend Jimmy had a great idea. It's like, you know what? We're gonna force the hand. He's like, okay, we're gonna go to California. We're gonna go out there. And either Hammer gonna tell us he's gonna take you on, sign you, or he's gonna send us back to El Dorado, Arkansas. So we took it upon ourselves and got on the Greyhound bus and rode to California. I went to Los Angeles with my cousin, and Jimmy went up to North California with his uncle in Oakland. This is how God works. Days out vu. He got off the bus, the bus station. The bus said they was all ecstatic and cheering and, and all happy. He's like, what's all so happy for me? He's like, you see, I'm shooting a video down the street. And the video he was shooting was, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, he comes a hammer. So my partner walks down the street, sees Hammer, talks to him. He said, the first thing he asked him when he saw him, he said, man, where's Benito? He said, he in Los Angeles. He said, what? He said, we just got it. I just got it today. But he told God, Los Angeles this morning on the bus. He said, call him right now. Call him right now. So y'all here. So that means they ain't got to sit for y'all no more. Y'all already here. He got on the phone. He called me. And first night I got the phone. I was like, yes, man. Someone picked me, man. I like, hello. Hey, what's up, Benito? I said, what's up? It's Hammer. I said, Hammer? Hammer who? MC Hammer, man. What you talking about? Because I, I, was, I was like shocked because I didn't know it was him. And he was like, yeah. He said, man, he said, stay where you at. Don't get in no trouble. Be cool. He said, I come to LA next week. I'm doing the Arsenio Hall show. He said, and when I do the Arsenio Hall show, I want to bring you back up here with me to Oakland. So I'm going to get your stuff set up or whatever. He said, I'm going to tell you the information. I'm going to give you a couple of days. I'm going to get back with you let you know what's going on. He did just that. Hammer came down to uh, LA, stayed at the Sophie Hotel in Beverly Hills. And I went up. And uh, wanted to go into the City Hall show because I didn't know how TV worked. And uh, we shot a City Hall show in the morning, like 9 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I called my mom and told him, I said, Mama, we're on TV tonight. So check it out. She's like, What? I said, yeah. So Mama told her the whole town, the whole town was at the house waiting for you. We came on television that night. And Hammer said, I got something for you. He said, uh, What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, come to you out there in the crowd. And I'm grab your hand and pull you up. And the camera gonna pan on me and you. And I see your face and know you're with me. That way you gotta say they don't they don't think I'm with you back home in Arkansas. I'm like, okay, cool, 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 cool. So it, I, all that stuff happened that fast. The Simon Senior Hall, the, the hometown was crazy. 
newspaper wrote about me. I was on television, all of that, and the rest was history. I went back to Oakland, California, and my career started. That's another one of those MCM stories. This story is about us being in Trinidad, <clears throat> Tobago. Um, we were over in Trinidad, Tobago for a concert, and um, we was inside McDonald's. And uh, this guy was in McDonald's, I mean, just ranting, just going off, acting crazy. And uh, we really didn't know what it was about. And then we started seeing him say, say the word hammer. Hammer, hammer, hammer. You know, they talk their language. You know, unless you're listening, you know their language, you wouldn't know. But he said hammer, hammer, hammer. Point his hands, flaming, you know, acting crazy. So we sat in line. Hammer sat in line, too. And the guy, like, forget a hammer. He come to our country and get money from us and knowing we're a poor country and go back to America. He don't love us. Forget a hammer, you know? And hammer stepped behind him. He's like, that's crazy. He listening to him. So our manager at the time, Craig Brooks, he uh, he wanted to step up and do something to the guy and remove him from the man. And hammer said, no, 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 don't, don't touch him. Don't touch him. Don't touch him. And hammer stepped to the guy and said, man, he said, how you doing? He said, who are you? Who are you? I mean, I know you. Get away from me. He said, excuse me, he said, he said, I'm the guy you've been talking about, saying that, you know, I'm coming here taking y'all money, whatever. Hammer said, if you feel that way about me, I can only imagine what the rest of the country feel like, me being over here. He said, let me ask you a question, sir. He said, um, how much money do you make a year? He said, what did that have to do with me? What, what are you asking me that question for? You know, asking questions like that. He said, I'm just, I'm just curious, sir. How much money do you make? And he told him the price, I forget what it was. Hammer told his uh, manager, Craig Brooks, said, go outside, Craig, get my briefcase. Come back in here. And uh, he said, no, for real. Our manager called Hammer for real by his last name. No, 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 for real. We ain't going to do that. We ain't going to do this. He said, man, go get my briefcase and come back. So he went and got the briefcase, came back inside the restaurant, and Hammer gave the man $2,000 in American currency. And, you know, back then, our money was worth like 14, 15 of that dollars in the country. Um... The dude was like, why did you give me this money? I do not want your money. He said, no, take that as a gift. He said, I, I want you to have it. He said, I'm blessed to have what I have. And I know that you will, uh, you know, have a lot of things you can't get here. So here's me blessing you. Take it and go take care of your family, man. And have a nice day. So after that, the guy, he teared up. He almost cried. Um, all the other workers inside me were like, yeah, man, we want money, we want money. So Hammer pulled out, you know, $100 bills and gave everybody, all the workers and everybody $100 inside the restaurant to make them happy too. And, uh, you know, the ambassador of the island was with us also. He was very, very proud that Hammer did something like that. You know, it was a really, really a great thing. It showed his humanitarianism of who he really truly is because he really loved people. This story here is about Hammer's brother, Louis Burrell. Phenomenal brother, tycoon, entrepreneur. Um, I don't even, I only had the words to explain to say what he was to me. When I came over to the camp, uh, I was 19 years old, and Louis took me on his wing the same way Hammer did. And a lot of times Hammer was up doing a lot of you know promotional stuff, but Louis was behind the business team. Louis was the guy that took his little brother. When I say literally overnight, I mean literally overnight. When he first jumped in with Hammer, Hammer was only making like $3,000 a show. Small amount of money, right? Lewis took Hammer from making $3,000 to $30,000 overnight. Overnight, literally. He's like, he got behind his little brother and said, my brother's the most phenomenal thing y'all seen in the last 20, 30 years. He's gonna be hotter than fish grease. Ain't nobody gonna be able to touch him. He's a dancing machine. Dance, 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 dance. He's a dancing machine. He was all of that. Hammer is the only guy that I ever seen dance in front of me and it's all my life. And I got chill bumps by watching him dance. He was that phenomenal. I was mind blown. We had a young kid from Arkansas, Eldorado, Arkansas to be exact. And seeing this man dance, I could see the aura. I could see the, the glow around him, who he was. 
And I was just elated that he had brought me into the fold. Come from a small town like Elderwood, Arkansas, to be on the big stage with him. He saw things in me that I didn't know I had. So it's like, it's crazy, man. But anyway, going back to Lewis. Lewis took me on his wing. I used to watch Lewis get on the phone and talk to corporate America, Pepsi, British Knight, uh, Al Heyman, uh, Dick Clark, all these guys for us dealing business with his little brother Hammer. And that's how I learned my savvy of being a, 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 a savvy businessman by watching Lewis and Lewis Steele is my teacher to this day. And I saw the way he handled those people. He's like, all of y'all want something from my little brother. We know what's going on. And you're not going to play us like that. For instance, with British Knight, he told British Knight, I want you to give me everything you have in your merchandise to all of my people in the group. He didn't just get it for Hammer. He got it for everybody. He made sure we all, he said, all the stuff y'all doing is a tax write-off. So we want all your jogging suits, your socks, your hats, your, your trinkets, your, your keychains, whatever you got that you get out for promotion and do what you do, British Knight. We want it for me and my brother and, and organization over here for Hammer Time. Uh, we had a bidding war up one time between Pepsi. You know how, how big Pepsi is and British Knight. British Knight was a billionaire guy. When we first met him, he came around. This dude came with a sports jacket on, some toe up jeans with his knees out, and some penny, them old ran down penny loafers. And looks like he's a billionaire. So fashion and clothes didn't mean nothing to him, you know? But I was like, wow, so this is how they do it, huh? He said, yeah, welcome to corporate America. But we had a bidding war against Pepsi and British Knight over who's gonna do our tour jackets. So, Lewis been the man he is. I want both of y'all to produce some jackets. Give me some prototypes. And we're going to pick out which one we want to use. So instead of them, you got it exclusive. We got it exclusive. Both of y'all going to make the jackets for us. British Knight put out a jacket for us first that had leather sleeves. Real leather. Pepsi made us one with some fake, some violent stuff. So when Lewis took the jacket back and showed Pepsi what they did, it, they did it. They went back and redid it and made us leather jackets like theirs was like, like, like Letterman or whatever, uh, tour jackets for us to redo it. It was, it was crazy, man, but these things happen. And I just saw this thing develop in front of me and watch Lewis. And Lewis, he said he loved me so much because I was one of the ones that liked to go to the, the boring business meetings with him. He would be in those meetings a lot of time by himself. So we weren't doing anything and we had time off. I would go with Lewis. I would fly out with Lewis to different cities around the country with him and be like his, uh, we call it, uh, apprentice in a sense, and sit back in the back of the room like this and listen and learn how the business actually operated and who these big time guys was. And they they came to me saying, hey, how you doing? Said, yeah, this is, my, this is my guy. Hi, Benito, how you doing? So I became more than just being an artist. I became a businessman because they always tell you in the music industry, learn the business. Always learn the business. And that's what I did. And I learned all that from Louis Burrell. Louis Burrell is a phenomenal guy, man. And I love you, Louis. And I know you still love me. We ain't talked in a minute, but uh, I love you, bro. And I'll be seeing you soon. Uh, the individual we're going to talk about on this one is Michael Jackson. The Michael Jackson. The Loved one. We were in uh, Universal City, at the Universal Share. That was our favorite hotel, besides the, the Salt Hotel that is in Beverly Hills. But we stayed at the Universal Sheridan. And un un unbeknownst to us, we found out that Michael Jackson was staying in the same hotel with us. And this is how we found out. We were in a room uh, practicing rehearsing because they had a big old suite. And he was in there with the dancers and everybody. Everybody was seeing what he was going to do for the video shoot, but too legit to quit. And um, we were making up a lot of noise, you know, dance, jumping up and down, bouncing, booming, you know, doing dance steps and everything like that, you know, too legit, too legit, to, you know, all of that. And all of a sudden, I had to knock on the door. Do, 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 do. So once again, our manager, Craig Brooks, he goes to the door, like, yeah, what's up? There's two dudes standing there with a uh, black suit on, look like, you know, secret agents, something, you know. And it's like, uh, we have a message for you, sir. He said, who was that? 
He said, we want to know who's in this room. He said, who want to know who's in this room? Who are you? He said, we were sent up here by Mike. He said, Mike who? He said, D Mike. He said, D Mike, D Mike who? So by that time, Hammer walks, he sees him, he walks over to the door. Like, what's going on? What's, what's happening? He said, we have a message for you. He said, who are you? He said, I'm MC, I'm MC Hammer. What's up? What's happening? He said, well, Hammer, Mike has a message to say. He said, Mike who, man? He said, the glove one. He said, Mike, Michael Jackson? He said, yes, sir. D Michael Jackson. He said, yeah, what, what, what Mike does it mean? He said, he, he's right below you, sir. And said that you, you all guys are making a lot of noise. And uh, can you please hold the noise down a little? I'm like, Mike's up under me. He's right up me right now. He said, yes, sir. So Hammer starts stomping the floor. <laughs> the pig went by. <laughs> he stomped the floor on him. Like, yeah, you can have Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway. Oh, uh, I was like, okay, then if, if Mike, if Mike wants me to stop uh, making all this noise, tell him to come tell me to my face. He said, since he's here, he hear this noise, tell him to come holler at me. I'll be here, I'll wait on you. We'll talk to you later. So I him close the door. Went back to rehearsing or whatever. About 20 minutes later, come and knock back at the door, man. And uh it was about eight of them then. And uh the guy, the little guy standing in the middle had a hoodie on. And uh Ham went to the door, what's up? You know what I'm saying? He was standing there. And uh, we stand the door because we was all trying to look and see too. We, I had never seen Michael Jackson in real life. So I wanted to see. So I was trying to get there. Everybody bumping them against each other, trying to see. We was all starstruck. And he pulled that hoodie off, man. And it was Michael Jackson. I was like, oh my God, that's really him. And you know, I've been around, doing what happened, I've been around all celebrities. Everybody from, you know, you know, you can name it, man. Anybody from I mean, Sister Janet, Nothing, Vanessa, Miss America, all that, all them people didn't really mean that. But seeing Michael was like a dream come true, and his voice was the same and everything. Like, Hammer, hi, Hammer, I love you, Hammer, I love your music, I love what you have going on. They told me what you said to come and tell you to your face about the noise or whatever. I, I, I'm not really tripping about the noise, Hammer. It's just that, um, you know, I was doing, I was writing something, and, and the noise kind of distracted me a little bit, and they told me it was you. And I had to come up here and see you for myself. Hammer hadn't even met, hadn't met, hadn't met Michael Jackson at the point. So that was Hammer's first time meeting him in person. They went to each other, they embraced and everything, so they're talking. And they moved on to the side. You know, our, our, our security, they security like blocked us off when we couldn't really hear what they were talking about. But uh, we heard that part and they made us go back inside and sit down. But just seeing that man, that connection with those two coming together was a great thing. And Hammer, I remember Hammer saying this to him though. He told him, he said, man, James mad at you. And he said, James who? He said, James Brown, the godfather. He's adopted me as his godson. And he's he's, a, he's upset with you, man. You can call James and talk to him. And he's like, give me, yes, give me his number. I'm calling yeah, call him right away. Yes. I love James Brown. He's, he's my favorite. I mean, just like you. He said, man, man, what did I do? He said, you went on the award show, Mike, and uh, you said something to the fact that Sammy Davis Jr. and uh, Nipsey uh, Russell and all them other cats was your influence. And James took it offensive because he felt that you should have said his name and you didn't say it. But um, if all y'all know, after that, shortly after that, the next award show came up, Michael made good on it because Mike came out and surprised James Brown after the performance. I don't know if y'all remember that. And he came out and put the put the cape on James. He thought that he thought it was Maceo, but it wasn't. Yeah, he turned around and saw Mike, and he grabbed him, hugged him, and kissed him, and they made up. But that's what another one of those crazy MC Hammer stories, man, that y'all probably don't know nothing about, man. It happened. It, it, that's one of them good ones, man.
part of that. California. We were on stage in Phoenix doing a concert. And uh, another one of my companions on stage, uh, we had a group called the Homeboy Choir. And um, the guy name was Joe Mack. Everybody knew Joe Mack. Y'all probably remember Joe Mack from uh, Let's Get It Started. Uh, when he was on the, on the come out and say, Hammer, you ain't hitting in New York. What? So what you go do about that? Hammer, I'm gonna turn this mother out. You know, that was his line. He's claiming the fame from way back in the day when Hammer was in 357 and him alone. But uh, anyway, back to Joe Mack. We're on stage, we're doing our routine dancing, whatever. And uh, Joe Mack was standing right beside me. This is the part that really got me because he was standing right beside me to my right hand side. I mean, my left hand side. And all of a sudden, you know, we had pyros on stage and, you know, explosions and all kind of, you know, things going off fizzle and excitement because we was hammer tapping. And uh, when it went off, boom, Joe Mack immediately grabbed his right leg and was like, <sighs> I thought he got burnt. I thought one of the pyros went bad or something and burned him, right? So he hobbled out. We had a thing we went back, go behind the scenes on his, you know, through the curtains in the back area and get dressed. We get ready to go to the next song. You're like, man, my leg, my leg, my leg, my leg burning, man. My leg burning. And I was like, man, hold up. And I'm trying to put it out. You know what I'm saying? Revenant, grab a towel, trying to put it out, and then security ran on stage. And I was stage, hand ran up with a flashlight, looked at his leg. And uh, our manager time, Greg Brooks, he looked at his leg and said, man, that ain't no, that ain't no power will burn. That's like a gunshot. And what it was, it was, it went in his leg. And when it came out the back of his calf, and he's like, man, Jonah got shot. And it's one of the things that happened that really made me think about what was going on. Um, I'm like, wow. So Craig takes him backstage with the medics and stuff. They looked at him, what up? And, uh, well, not the medics, I take that back. Not the medics, but some of the people that were, like on the side of the stage got a Medicaid kit. And um, we go back to the back, wrap his leg up and everything. And we got in the dress room. Uh, Craig and them was talking to him and they told him, don't tell them you got shot on stage. Tell them you was walking down the street and someone shot you. We don't want this to get back to the tabloids because here's the tabloids that we're getting shot at on, on tour. Someone shot you on them. It's the stage. we we'll tarnish the tour and we don't need that happening. And Hammer told him, he said, look, I'm gonna take care of you, Joe. Just don't do not tell them you got shot on my stage. So I take care, I got you. And when I heard that, man, I was like, whoa, wow. That's when I understood the, the, the importance of what show business really means and how they do what they do to protect it. And Joe went to the hospital and said, did exactly what they told him to do. And uh, so he's walking down the street, somebody shot him with their visiting and whatever. And um, he wanted to come back on the road the next day and they sent him back to Oakland to go heal. Cause you know, Joe's mother was frantic. He, you know, her son got hurt and he went back, oh, he got off the road by, maybe about two weeks. He was gone by two weeks to heal, you know, saying his leg or whatever. But Hammer, from my understanding, took care of him, you know. And, uh, well, I know he took care of him. But uh, it was one of the crazy things that happened, man. Joe got shot on stage. And after that, that's when the alerts really went up. You gotta understand, we had, that had been two, sh two shooters we had been involved in within a month's time. This all happened within a month. And they were talking to Hammer about certain things and they told Hammer to put on a bulletproof vest while he was on stage. Hammer, he rejected it at first. He did not want a bulletproof vest. He did not want to wear a bulletproof vest on such stage. He did not want to do that. He said, they're going to shoot me, kill me. They're going to shoot me in my head. And that's, that's going to be it. I was like, nah. His brother's like, nah, nah, nah. But I want you to put a vest on, bro, just, just in case. Because we don't know who it is. We don't know who was in the audience that shot Joe. You know, whatever. We don't know if it's... It was a planned hit or what, what happened, hit the wrong person. My thing was, I was standing right there, he could have hit me. And I could have been shot, you know? <laughs> I was scared. So with that being said, I, like two weeks later from, from that point, we went to Oakland and Hammer was very concerned about this. They said, we're going back to the town. And I know how the town is, I'm, I'm, he said, I got a lot of enemies in the town. For what reason, I don't know. But you know, from just me being who I am, so they could have somebody planted in the audience, try to shoot me in Oakland. 
it made me look bad at home or whatever. And we did, a lot of y'all don't know it, but we was on stage, Cameron had that bulletproof vest on up on his suit. And uh, he, he danced a couple times to make sure he was comfortable. You know what I'm saying? He didn't move around too much, but uh, you couldn't tell, you could not tell he had it on. But he did, he had that bulletproof vest on to protect himself. Get somebody try to shoot him with a high power rifle or anything else like that, you know? But he was prepared. He said, I'm not gonna let them stop me from doing my tour. And he did that. This next story talks about a guy that tried to extort Hammer in uh, Los Angeles, an extortion situation. It goes by the name of, um, <laughs> this guy, he's, let's see, how can I say this? He did the video back in the day we all in the same game. Mike Conception. Mike was, was something serious. He's a guy, he's in a wheelchair, but he was a, a gang member from the Carson, he was supposed to start at the Carson Crips, which they say, the Carson Crips. Anyway, we were at a function one night in Hollywood and we come out and uh, in the back, you should get ready to get in the van to go back to the hotel. And this guy like, hey, I wanna talk to y'all for a minute. I wanna speak to Hammer. The guy in a wheelchair and rolled him up, you know, and like, who was this? He had about eight, he had about eight, nine guys with him or whatever. They were Crips. And uh, he's like, man, your hammer on the hot you for a minute, you know? He's like, and then uh, Hammer's brother, Lewis, was like, who are you? He's like, I'm my conception. He's like, he said, and then Hammer's like, yeah, Yo, you remember him? Man, we did the video with him, you know, the all the same gang video, you know? He said, yeah, 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 okay, okay, okay. So, He said, yeah, I'll see you around, you know, so the next day uh, I was down in the lobby at a hotel, once again, the Universal Sheridan. And uh, a matter of fact, the group Jodeci was there. That's when I first met Jodeci. They were there in a the hotel out there doing some stuff with a uh, puppy. I said they shooting a video or something, but they were staying in the same hotel we was at. Because we were down there in L.A. shooting the, the footage for um, 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 Too Legit to Quit. So it was down, we was in L.A. for like a whole month. But the next day, the guy, my conception, shows up at the hotel. He had one guy with him. And he was like, man, uh, I guess he remember me being with Hammer the night before. Like, hey man, oh, uh, hey man, when you with Hammer, whatever, I'm looking at him like, I didn't want to say nothing because I'm like, dude, I don't know you. You know what I'm saying? And uh, he's like, man, I want to speak to Hammer, man. Can you, can you get him on the phone? Can I talk to him for a minute? I want to holler, man, I want to apologize to him, whatever. I'm like, what? So he said, I, I didn't even pay no attention. I walked off, you know? Going about my business. But come to find out later, we was ready to go somewhere. Dude was still in the lobby waiting for Hammer. He waited out there for about two hours, I know. And um, we come down to go do something. He was in there, he's like, Hammer, 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 man, let me speak for a minute. Hammer looked at him and, and kept walking. He said, Hammer, man, hey, man, please, brother, let me, let me hide you for a minute, brother. And uh, Hammer said, What is it, man? What's up? He said, I just want to apologize for what I did last night, man. You know, I apologize. I didn't mean to do it, man. I didn't, I didn't know who you was. I didn't know who you knew. And, all this kind of stuff. So all of a sudden now, I guess 
a phone call went out or whatever it was on the situation and dude got ticked about it. He, he looked really scared. He looked, he looked very fearful. But we come to find out later that this same guy, he had extorted Teddy Riley, he had extorted Babyface, and he had extorted Bobby Brown. And the list probably goes on and on and on. It's like the things you see now today, this thing's been going on for a long time in the city. And it ain't just about the rappers. It's been about any type of entertainment. Once you come to Los Angeles, these guys feel like you gotta check in or talk to them before you come to their city or strange things that happen. You can't even go there to handle business. So, you know, now we got all this crazy thing like TMZ and everything jumping out behind you with the cameras and everything. They alert people in the city that you're inside that city. And uh, that's why you gotta be careful with your cell phones, let them know where you at, eating and all this type of things, you know, your location. Cause these guys will be sitting low, man, to rob you and, and take what you have. Cause it's, it's a city of the den of thieves. Man, you gotta come on, baby. This bumps in the bumps too, man. You gotta come. Oh no, dog, you ain't in the bed, man. Come on, hell, man. This pumps in the bumps. Cause you can't sleep at a time like this. Get up. This pumps in the bumps too, man. Run it back, Brian. Run it back. Yeah, man, I ain't talking about sports, man. You gotta come on, man. This story here it goes. We talk about uh, on this one, Dion said. On site, we like, man, look at this. And we stopped and we all, you know, gave each other dap or whatever. He said, I told y'all boys, y'all so. He said, Arkansas can't mess with Florida, baby. He said, It's Florida, baby. This Florida right here. He said, the Arkansas, the Arkansas boys are so. We like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever. But uh, we talked, we said, Dion, how fast are you, man? Dion, like, man, I ain't never clocked myself. I don't know how fast I am. He said, I'm one of the fastest men in the NFL. Might be one of the fastest men on this planet. At that time, Dion basically was. He said that um, they tried to play him one time. Uh, I think another athlete did, I forget who it was, uh, back in the day. But they wanted him to get on TV and run against a horse. And Dion was like, do I look like a clown to you? You look, I think I'm gonna get on here and run against a horse. And he said, I don't, I don't do things like that. That ain't even my character. 
you know, he said, uh, put me up to run against the money and I'll run against it. But no, nah, he said, it ain't even about, you know, the situation, but I'm not going to run against the horse. We were in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, we was on tour. And we was playing a softball game, but then we used to do that a lot of time, play softball with different, you know, celebrities or with uh, community groups, things like fire department, police department, stuff like that around the country. This particular day, we we're out playing the softball game and uh, these guys passed by in the El Camino, never forget it. And one of our guys with us named, thought about the name of Frosty, um, he had met a girl from the country for the night before. And one of the guys, you know, hey, whatever her name was, he called her name, like, come here for a minute. I'm out here. He said, what? You know, played him off like distant. What? The gone, man. Oh, you with, them, you with them guys right there now, huh? The new dudes, because huh? they, they didn't know who we were. They're like, yeah, you gonna be with them, huh? That's how you doing it? Because we was off to the side. Everybody else was on the field playing. We was just chilling, you know, in the, like almost in the parking lot, just hanging out. And, uh, okay, we see what time it is. So he said something else to her. And she said something back and he called out her name, called her B.I., you know, you know the rest. And uh, my guy, Frosty, was like, hey, you she said, you know, he from, he from East Oakland, too. You should just say it on what? To get on, bro, bro, move around. You know what I'm saying? She done told you, don't call out her name like that. We don't play that around here. So I had security, uh, Hammer's head security, still to this day, his name is Wee Wee. Wee Wee said, he, he peeped it out and said, hey, Frosty, sit down, chill out, man. He said, them dudes look like they may be some gangbangers or something. He said, but uh, he said, but keep a watch out because they might circle back. You know what I'm saying? And just like he said, he did not lie, spoke on it. Like he knew, because you're a street cat. We, we know the streets. And uh, these cats went back down the street, man, and circled back, man, and came back up and shot at us. Shot at us. We out there playing softball with, with, with the fire department and some of the policemen. These dudes is shoot. Letting it off. So we all getting down, jumping on the ground, man. One of our representatives from Pepsi was on the road with us. Man, about his name was Delaney. Delaney got shot in the elbow, got hit in the elbow right here, one bullet. And oh my God, that set it off. He was he was ecstatic, he was mad. He's like, man, been out on the road with y'all now, man, becoming dangerous. Y'all guys got the, you got too much going on. Um Frosty got disciplined, Ham was mad about it, but he was the only one that got, or wound up getting shot in the elbow. And uh, we was on high ladies, we was, we was on high alert from that point on for the rest of the tour of that year. And uh, lesson learned, man, you can't, you got here, you deal with people, you can't talk crazy to people. You know, you gotta let it go, man, and keep moving.
uh, the organization broke down around 1993, I think it was, and Hammer, you know, filed for bankruptcy. And I left and did my solo career and everything, right? My mama still received that money from Hammer, that $1,000, for two years after I was gone for the organization. Talk about a good dude, man. Hammer never stopped it. I think the reason why it really got stopped was because when the bankruptcy people finally found out and did all the, you know, the backtracking and everything, they cut the money off. But my mom received that money for two years after I was going for the organization. And I salute you, man. I love you forever, bro. Forever, forever. This story here is about Ice Cube. Yay, yay. <laughs> NWA member. Tycoon, movie director, all these great things. We want a situation that with Ice Cube with us, with Hammer back in the day. Once again, um, Cube was another one of the artists that, that kind of diss Hammer on video and on record. And we were in Hollywood, we was there down and shooting two to the quick, you know, uh, series, and then, but in the video and the movie. Um, and we got a phone call at the hotel. We stayed at the Universal Sheridan. And, uh, and was like, what? What's going on? Hold him there, hold him, hold him right there, stall him out, stall him out. So we jumped up and said, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. So we all get in the cars, bodyguards and everybody else, we rushed them back over to Hollywood. And uh, we wound up at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffle over in Hollywood. And uh, the guy, who was our spot person, was came, I said, yo, he inside, he's getting his food. He's like, okay. So maybe a minute later, Q come walking out with two bags in his hand, food. <laughs> Cube looking for like, hey, the, you see 12 guys standing in front of you standing there looking at you. You're like, you're going to be like, hey, what's going on? And so Hammer stepped out like, yo, Q, what's up, man? He, oh, oh, what's up? Hey, what's up, Hammer? What's going on? He said, I'm going to come talk to you about that video you did, man. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, got me all tied up and taped the duct tape over my mouth and threw me in the trunk and doing all these crazy things, you know what I'm saying? Making a mockery of who I am, man. I don't play like that, man. I said, why, why y'all guys put out this, this, this negative energy, bro? You know what I'm saying? He said, all I try to do all the time, I try to help people and help make us become better. He said, because I crossed over, it's like y'all done made me a target. He said, I don't like it, man. I don't like it. Said, hey, Hammer, man, hold up, Hammer. Man, I'm sorry, man. I am so sorry, Hammer. It's just a video, man. Hammer, look, man, ain't nothing like that, man. I ain't nothing like that at all, man. I, I just, you know, I'm just I'm just giving you fair warning, man. You know what I'm saying? That don't let it happen no more. He said, yes, sir. No, it will not happen again, Hammer. Hey, man, I appreciate it. He said, man, y'all need to bring all the, all the guys with you, man. I'm all right, man. He said, hey, I, I'm not like that, Hammer. Not that like it at all. It's okay. All right, Q. All right, Q. I'm going to holler at you later. He said, hey, it's done. Don't worry about me. I won't be doing no more videos or nothing like that, man. That's crazy. I'm, I'm good. And uh, one of the crazy things, man, <laughs> is that we got ready to go. I don't know why, but attention to him, when the bodyguards they start laughing. I said, what you laughing at? He said, look at Cube's pants. And we looked back at Cube, he had some shorts. I looked at Cube's pants in the front, man. He had saw them. Cube had urinated on himself, I guess, because he was scared. I mean, you know, anybody else I know would have been scared too. You got 12 guys out there, you by yourself, and you know, it's almost like an LA to say you got caught slipping. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was the craziest thing right there, man. Another one of them crazy MC Hammer stories. This story here about MC Hammer is very, very dear to me. Um, I was very saddened when this happened. This happened in Chicago, Illinois. Um, we were there, we did a show that night with uh, TLC, Boys and Men, and um, I can't think who else was on tour with us at the time, but in Chicago, the Minister Farrakhan came out and visited our show. And um, this has to do with my good friend, Khalil Roundtree. Khalil Roundtree was the manager for Boys and Men at the time. And um, we came back to the hotel after the show, and uh, we was in our rooms, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, we heard a noise, two pops, like, pop, pop. We're like, what was that? And all the cats, you know, most guys from the street will know 
been in neighborhoods around America, in the hood, and the ghetto, you know gunshots when you hear them. And everybody opened their doors. We was in our room, opened our doors, and looked out the hall, you know, trying to see what's going on. Because we knew there was gunshots, but we didn't know where it came from. And then maybe like 30 seconds later, we heard it screaming and hollering. So we knew when, when the four, we ran out to the end of the hall, the stairway, looking down, couldn't see nothing. Then went down, went down a, a one case of stairs to the next floor and opened the side door. And uh, we got Drew down on one because our bodyguards had guns. They had Drew down thinking we might have been the sailors or whatever. But the elevator door was open. And I remember looking inside the elevator and seeing my friend, Khalil Ron Tree, against the wall with his head up like this looking to the sky. And he was deceased. Um, they held the elevator and put it on stop because they wanted to go down to the floors. And some of my girl dancers came out the room, they, was, they saw it and they screamed and hollered, you know, it was frantic. Um, couldn't have found out what happened was, uh, guys had shot and killed him. Uh, it wasn't a robbery, anything like that. They had came up on the floors of the hotel and they was knocking on doors. Uh, and about, where those hammer girls at? Where them hammer girls at? We were talking about hammer girls. And they knocked on the door, the door of Sean. Uh, from Boys and Men, and Sean called Khalil, which was there. Also, the security. Uh, it had another security guard by the name of Quadri. He was with them. He got shot also. He got shot in the leg. But Khalil Rancho got shot in the head. And um, the guy was bailing on the door. So when they came out to retreat, they were going to take them downstairs and have them leave. Like, man, you can't be on these floors like that. Y'all got to go downstairs. You're disturbing our artists. There ain't no hammer girls up here. But we all got, the whole police department came down and they took us all downtown, the station. We thought we were gonna miss our show for that day. Our show was the next day in Milwaukee. Which, you know, after something like that happened, a tragedy, we really didn't wanna do no show. Everybody was sad because it was just like family. And we finally got out of there that evening late, around about five o'clock, and went straight to the airport to get on our plane and fly to Milwaukee. We made it for the show, but it was very, Hammer announced it, it was very short and quick, and uh, sent our condolences. But come to find out, the guys who did the murder were one of the guys was from the hotel. He was a bellman. He was from downstairs. He was a bellman that took our girls' bags to all their rooms throughout the day with our bodyguards and dropped them off. And his friend was another bellman from across the street at a hotel. And then another one of their friends. There was three of them. And they both came there after the show that night. They'd been drinking. They would drink, they were drunk or whatever. And acting crazy, man. And one of committing the murder. And the reason why we found out who, who did it, one of the guys was with them, it was eating on his soul. And he told the police everything, he turned himself in and told the police everything. They wanted to find the, the murder weapon and then they threw it in the river. They found the weapon when he threw it away, divers and everything. And 